Hey folks, it's pretty easy to get flow maps working in the viewport, uh, but we have one or two extra steps then in terms of getting it set up so that we can render it. The main part of the video will be aimed at new users. The video is primarily focused on rendering flow maps within Houdini, so I'm not going to cover a lot in terms of creating the atmospheric effects. And primarily, this is to keep the video shorter, and also because <laughs> when I did the original uh, version of this video, I tried to use volumetrics quite a lot, which increases your render time, and I did something fairly unspeakable to the planet Jupiter, uh, which I will show you later on in the video. Uh, so uh, I decided to bail on that, and I'll just show you the simpler solution that I came up with, which is what you can see here. All right, let's dive in. I'm going to throw down a geo container, and I'm going to throw down a sphere. I'm just going to put the radius here up to one. Now we're going to need some UVs, so I'll put down a UV project. That's because we're going to be distorting textures. Uh, anything to do with textures is going to need some UVs. I will make my projection here polar. Now I'm going to want some more polys uh, because our flow map is essentially vertex colors. So I'm going to subdivide this and I'm going to set the depth to two. So I'm going to put another subdivide down after that one and that's going to go to two as well. So I can always disable one of these if I need to lower the poly count and it's pretty easy for me to just do that. I'm going to uh, initialize our flow map by using the labs flow map tool here. You will need to have side effects labs installed to get access to these uh, as I touched on in the previous video. I'll put a link to that in the description. Now, in this case, I'm going to use a flow map guide node. And a flow map guide node normally is going to require a curve input. So what I want to end up with is something like this. I want to have curves that flow around a planet. And I could try and draw curves onto a sphere, but that could get a little bit tricky. Um, so I'm going to do it in a slightly different way. I'm going to use a sphere and I'm going to cut it up into curves. So I want to have good control over the lines that I get from this sphere. So I'm going to create a new one just here. I'm going to make it the same size, so I'll put it up to 1. Now I'm only interested in the horizontal lines around the planet, so I'm going to just take the rows here, and I'm going to put this to 8 here to get a little bit less vertically, and maybe we'll have 40 going around the outside, and that will just get me some more points around the outside of my curves. Now these are actually polygons currently, if we take a look at our smooth edit mode. That's not what I want. So I'm going to put down an ends node here just to get rid of the polygon by breaking the join at the end of each circle. And I can do that on close U here. I can just say unroll with new points. And now we get circular polylines running around the outside of where the sphere would have been. I'm going to put a resample under this so I can control the number of points that we're going to get. And underneath this I will put a mountain node or I could use a point jitter as well. We can come back and set all of these later once we get the flow map set up. So underneath this, I can put down a smooth so I don't get too many jaggies. So I want to get a different flow direction for every other curve here. So I need to group uh, every second curve. So we can use a group by range node to select every second curve. And I'm going to change this to start and end. So I'll stick the, 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 the start to zero and we'll put the end to 10. We don't, we have less than 10, so that's fine. And then we just need to select every second one. So now we've got every second curve. And for every second curve, I want to reverse the direction. So we can just use a reverse node and we can set that to group one. Now we can plug this into our flow map guide here on the right hand side. It's gonna turn off points here. And let's plug this guy into a color and see what kind of colors we're getting. So flow map to color here. And you can see that we are getting different colors for every second line. If I turn off the reverse here, you'll see it's all one color. And if I turn it back on, you'll see, yes, we're getting different directions for every line. So I'm just going to turn off the UV checker here with the little UV checker button here. And we can see this is our flow map color. And these are being displayed in the viewport because they have a CD color value. So I can smooth out our flow map because you can see it's pixelating in some parts by just using a smooth node. And instead of smoothing point positions, we can smooth CD. 
and then we can come along and increase our strength here and that will smooth out my flow map just a little bit now i'd like to see my flow map distorting uh, an actual texture and there is another side effects labs node for that it is flow map visualize now this is an open gl visualizer so it will work in the viewport and generally anything to do with OpenGL can be a little bit flecky because it is dependent on your graphics card. Uh, so you can see it's disappeared here for me. Now, in this case, it's because I've got lighting turned on. So let's just turn it off here and you can see that something is happening here. This is an image that ships with Houdini. So this is the image I'm expecting to see being distorted. Now it will distort over time. And you can see that that's not exactly working for me. Now I've had issues with this before. Uh, so I'm going to try changing this over to texture for a second and see if I can get some movement. Okay, so this mode here is looking for a flow map that would be written out to disk. So this isn't doing anything really other than just moving the texture at the moment. I'm going to put it back over to color and now it should try to use my my color map. Yes, it is. It is starting to get me something. So that's a little bit of a bug that I run into. I just have to turn over to texture and then back to color. And now you can see I am getting some motion my texture is being distorted by my flow map and it's flowing in either, in either direction and we can test this out a little bit if i come up here to my mountain node i could increase my amplitude and that will increase the lines so it will increase these lines here which are then getting passed into my flow map guide node so i'll just turn them on and off and you'll see what i mean so now i'm introducing more eddies to my flow map if you want to think of it that way and i'm smoothing it out and then we're getting the results here so it's distorting my map even more okay so i could go back and play with all of those you can see me turning it on and off here uh, so this is the basic setup i'm just going to slow the speed down a little bit more and i'm going to slow down the I'm going to lower the distortion amount and I'm going to change the tiling here to make our planet feel a little bit bigger. You can see it's playing back very quickly. So let's go to our global animation settings here and we're going to say real time playback. Maintain real time playback, possibly skipping frames if we need to. Save as default and close that. And that is much more like what you would expect from 240 frames. And now we're getting some slow fluid like motion across the planet's surface. Now I want to see what this looks like distorting a planet texture. So I've got a downloaded one. I'm just going to turn up the speed just a little bit. Just so it's a little bit easier for us to see what's going on. And now you can see that the planet surface is starting to move. As the flow map distorts the texture. So you will notice that we run into one or two issues in terms of the texture distortion. And this really is a limit of flow maps as an idea it is essentially blending one version of the texture over another version of the texture so you can see if you follow the red spot just here it starts to fade out and it starts to fade back in at the start okay now that is a limitation of flow maps so we would be best to try and hide some overtly obviously repeating patterns like that so that is how you would go about distorting a planet texture and that will work just fine in our viewport you'd be forgiven for thinking you can put your uh, render flag and display view down here at the bottom and then just jump over uh, to the render view and hit render and you would expect to see your texture map now you're not going to see that and that's because your viewport the flow map visualize here is written in OpenGL and Houdini and in this case we're rendering in Mantra, Houdini Mantra does not understand OpenGL by default. So all that we get is the flow map color, which has been written out to CD and the renderer does understand that. So that's what we get and our texture disappears. So that's the problem that we have to try and solve. We need to come up with a way to get our flow map information into a shader that Houdini can go and render. Your initial thought might be to jump into the flow map visualize here. So we could say allow editing of contents and you might jump in here and you might go, okay, well, what are the labs guys doing? They have a shop net here. They've created a, sh uh, a shader over here and then you might try and jump into this and you can't. And the reason that you can't is it's been written in 
code so it's written in OpenGL so it is a locked asset here so we can show the type properties and if we were to jump over to code here this would give you an idea of what they've actually done uh, so it's created much like a shader that you might create in a game engine so it has a vertex shader a fragment shader and a geometry shader component to it and you can go down through it and you can try and figure out exactly what they are doing here right uh, essentially what they are doing and what all flow maps are doing is they are distorting the UVs using the color information that we're giving it and that will start to distort your texture in a flow like manner the problem that you will run into is that you will start to very quickly distort your texture so that is it is a big uh, a big splodgy mess so what you need to do is set the texture to repeat so you get it to loop essentially and that is what this code is doing in one format or another in theory to get the flow map to render so that you can get some lighting onto your planet surface here you could take that OpenGL shader code and you could rewrite it in whatever shader language that you are using uh, and that's what I was going to do to try and answer the request I had on the previous video but thankfully it turned out to be much more straightforward than all of that so what we can do instead here is let's put down a material node at the end of our chain here. Okay. And let's jump over to the material context of Houdini. And I'm going to put down a material builder. Uh, so I'm going to keep things as simple as I can for myself here. I'm going to delete all of these guys. And I'm just going to keep the surface outputs because really we just care about the surface color. I'm going to put down a principal shader core here and I will put down a compute lighting and I'll just hook up layer to here and CF can go out and let so CF is our color OF is our going to be our opacity and we can put out our uh, BSDF as well I was going to spend the rest of this video essentially translating the OpenGL code into shader nodes. Somewhere about halfway through that I ended up hitting tab and typing flow and I noticed that there is a labs flow map distort node. And this is a VOPS implementation of the OpenGL code. It's already been done here. So we can use this instead and save ourselves all that time. Now this flow map the start node is looking for a few different inputs. So one thing that it needs is UVs. So let's put down a UV chords node here and let's plug UVs here into UV. The next thing it's looking for is these flow map colors. So we need to try and get these colors into our shader. Now these colors are put out towards CD, which is why they're showing up in the viewport here. So I'm going to put down a bind node to call in a, an attribute into my shader here and I'm going to set the name to CD and color is a three float uh, is a vector three there's three components to it and we can take the CD color which is on my geometry and I'm going to plug that into flow map color here and then I'm going to take the result of all this and I'm going to put it into the base color for our shader and let's try hooking this thing up and rendering it and see if it will work. I'm going to rename this to flow map. And then I'm going to jump back over to the OBJ context. So I'm just going to point my material to our flow map uh, material node that we just created. And now if we jump back over to our render view and you can see we are getting an image which is being distorted. Now it's not the image that I'm expecting. And that's because I need to go back to my shader and point it to the correct image. Now, there's one or two handy little things to know when jumping between contexts in Houdini. Uh, the first is, is that we can be in multiple places at the same time. Um, so I'm in the game's uh, desktop here and I have folded away some of the panes. If I pop this pane out here, you can see... I can have two different panes here. This is me in the OBJ context. I can set this one over to material and I can jump into my material here. So I can be over in OBJ here and doing my thing over in SOPS. And at the same time, I can jump around here in my material and adjust my material as well. Okay, if I select my uh, flow map distort node here, uh, my the, the one inside in VOPS here, 
um, I can go and start adjusting these and you can see that this is the one that is being currently rendered. You can start to see that it updates in the render over here. Uh, so it is in fact this diffuse texture that has been shown. So I need to go and point this to my Jupyter texture that I downloaded. Okay, now ideally I would like there to be some connection between what I see in my viewport, so what I'm seeing here, and what I see in the render. Um, now I had opened this node to take a look around inside it, so I'm just going to say match current definition, that's going to lock it again. Um, so what I'm going to do is I am going to channel reference from what I see in the viewport to what I'm going to see when I render. I'm going to overwrite all of these values here with the values that I've got in SOPs. Okay, so and that's just uh, that's just channel referencing, so that's pretty straightforward to do. I can right click here and I can say copy parameter for my diffuse tiling. And for the diffuse tiling inside my VOP, I can say paste relative reference and you can see it has been copied over. Okay, or a slightly faster way to do the same thing is I can drag from my SOP here to my VOP and I can say relative channel reference. And I can do the same thing here. And I can do the same thing for all of these, okay? Now when I update the tiling here, it will update over here. And when I update texture here, it will update over here as well. Okay, so let's go back to our render view and see if that's worked. I can go and take a look at my material node. And yes, you can see the texture that I'm pointing to it on disk over here is now getting pulled in over here and we're getting a render of our texture which is more like what I'm expecting and if I come back over here and I change my tiling to one by whoop, one you can see that my render here is updating and I'm getting a much clearer uh, view of my texture now the next problem we need to solve is in my scene view over here if I if I move my timeline if I move my timeline over here in my scene view, we can see that we are getting some animation. However, if I go over to my render view here and I go and look at my output for my render, you can see as I scrub through it, we are not getting any animation. And that is because there is a time variable here on our flow map. And it says, if we hover over it, it says, the time at which the flow map needs to distort that. This input should usually be fed the scene time. Now, we can try putting $FF in here, which is the current frame number, and you can see that that is not getting us any movement. You can also see that we get a warning over here, and it says, cannot have channels which depend on time. So within our shading context, we can't drive anything with these global variables for time. Okay, so the way to get around this, uh, because we can't have time directly within our shading network, is to create a parameter. And the parameter will be promoted up, it will be at the, the next level up, and we can use that to reference time and we can pull it into our shader. So we can call this time here and I'll give it a label of time. And I'm going to plug this parameter here into time. And this parameter is going to appear up here. So up at the next level. So it gets promoted automatically. And this parameter I can drive with dollar frame. Now if I step through, we can see that, yeah, we are getting some animation coming through on our flow map. Okay, so that's how we get around that one. So now our render texture is really starting to come together and we've got some correlation between what we see in our viewport here uh, when we look at our flow map visualize and what we're seeing when we render over here. So that really covers most of what you would need to create a rendered version of a flow map on a planet in whatever renderer you would like to use. Getting flow maps working while rendering in Mantra was the main task that I wanted to tackle today. Of course, while I was doing the tutorial, I then went off and created a whole load of other versions of this file and got a little carried away with myself. And I decided that I was going to create an atmosphere for it and I was going to have some kind of light scattering through the atmosphere and maybe a thunderstorm going on across the planet and all of these other kind of things that 
always happened when I jump into Houdini. And it all started to get a little too complicated. I kept going at it up until a point. And then at some point, I took a break and came back to look at it. And I realized that I had turned the largest planet in our solar system into <laughs> something that looked a little bit more like uh, Santa's ball sack. <laughs> So at that point, I said, I had to stop. This is like two o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. And I was like, okay, well, this is time to take a break from this and I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, so while there is something interesting in terms of trying to create a an atmosphere with volumes, the problems that you run into are that volumes take a long time to render and that the more detail you want, the volume rendering time is going to increase. Uh, so you might be clever and think, okay, well, I can use volume displacement to try and get more detail instead of generating more voxels. But of course, rendering volume displacement also takes a lot of time. And if you push it too hard, you end up with uh, something that looks more like sheep's wool, which is what I've got going on here. So I backed away from that as an idea and I decided to continue with the flow map idea. So I'm going to very quickly take you through the final setup that I had. Now, I'm not going to go through it in detail. This is f more for people who are uh, want to go on to next steps uh, to see how far they can push it. So this is the overall file. You can see that this is Jupiter here. So this is the setup that we just created. And that will get you as far as having a flow map that you can visualize here and a flow map that you can render just there. So let's go and take a look at just the updated version of the Jupiter flow map here. So this is exactly what we were looking at in the previous, except I also added some displacement in here. So let's go and take a look. So this is the setup that we had before, uh, going into base color. But I also split this map out here. And I split out one of the black and white components of it. So I'm going from a vector to a float. I'm multiplying that by a very small number here. And I'm plugging that into displacement. Okay, so I plug it into displacement down here. And I need to turn on enable input displacement. Um, and keep in mind with displacement, you are going to need to change the frame number here to get the whole thing to load back into memory. Otherwise, uh, it will just take what's cached into memory already. Uh, so you'll probably need to change frame and then the displacement should kick in for you and you can dial it up and down using this multiply constant here okay you will need to uh, just pay attention to your displacement bounds just a little bit it should be set up okay okay so that is all i'm doing there this is irrelevant this bit down here so color goes out and displacement comes down here and it just helps me to pick up a little bit of shading as the light is moving across are going so this setup here is to try and create an atmosphere around the outside so again it's another sphere and i scale it up ever so slightly and that is going into a shader here okay now this shader here is going to give me a blue outline around the outside so if i was to go and look at the render here it is this blue outline here it is not the soft glow that we're getting that comes from a volume it is this hard lined blue edge here okay so what i did there was i created a slightly bigger sphere and i used a fresnel shader uh, if you were using something like arnold or or, or or other renders it might be called a facing ratio shader but within mantra it is called a fresnel shader and i use that to pick up a highlight around the edge here so i'll just very quickly show you that shader uh, and really it's fairly simple this is the main bit of it here uh, it's a fresnel shader and this is an example of what the fresnel shader will get if you just plug it straight into the base color here now that's getting plugged into our ramp and the ramp is just coloring this fresnel fall off and this is an example of what you get when you color the Fresnel. And then that's going into opacity just here. That gets me this green highlight towards the edges, but it is more see-through towards the center. Now, all that this bit up here is doing is adding a little bit of noise into the base color. So it's just trying to break it up a little bit because I felt that edge was a little too clean. So this is just some turbulent noise again, and it's multiplied by a Fresnel. I just put it into base color there, so that's all that's happening there. And then uh, the issue with that is, is that when I go to render it, I've got a sphere, okay, granted a somewhat see-through sphere on top of another sphere, but the outside sphere cat casts a shadow on the inside sphere. Now, normally you could take care of that uh, by using object candidates in your Mantra render node. That won't be so easy to do here without breaking all the different components into their own objects uh, at object level. So I used a little trick here, which is uh, I used is shadow and then I plug that into not. So we're saying this does not have a shadow. And then I'm multiplying that by my Fresnel here to say that this whole thing here will not create any shadow 
Uh, that's a handy little trick to avoid having to use object candidates. So I can do this within the one object node. So that got rid of the shadow running across it. So that was that section. Uh, the next bit was the clouds. And again, I wanted a solution that did not involve volumes. So really what I did was I decided to use the same flow map idea. Again, I'm just starting with a sphere here and I need to generate curves running across the sphere. Okay, so these are curves that I'm going to use to try and draw the f uh, to push the flow map for the clouds around. So initially I was being very clever and I said I'd move particles across the surface and generate lines off of that. Just because we can make things complicated in Houdini does not mean we need to. Uh, so instead I decided to scatter a whole lot of line, uh, scatter a whole lot of dots and connect adjacent pieces and that gets me as far as here. So now I've got a whole lot of lines running all over the place. I can resample those lines, I can transform them and then I can jitter them a little bit, smooth them out and then I can ray them back onto the surface. I do the same thing I did before in terms of grouping a certain amount of them. I'm going to reverse those and then I'm going to ray those back out onto the original planet surface. And so now I've got all these lines that move around here. So these are going to be sort of the high pressure and low pressure areas that are going to push the clouds around. And if I turn on my flow map to color here, I've cranked this up just a little bit. I cranked up the strength of the, the flow guide here. But you can see I'm getting lots of interesting values running across my sphere now based on those curves. Over here, I've downloaded a high-res uh, high picture of some clouds. So here's what the clouds look like. This was actually more high res. I shrunk it down a little bit and I blurred it out just a little bit because I'm going to use it for the color of the clouds, but I'm also going to use it for displacement. I've played around with the speed and distortion here and the strength of the guides. I can go back and play with all of those, but essentially what I get is this kind of soft moving cloud motion. Now, again, we need to keep in mind uh, flow maps are essentially blending from one image to another so we can't distort them too much but it gives a feeling that the clouds are moving in different directions and I'm getting a sense of scale that I think is sort of difficult to achieve with uh, with volumes and it's cheaper to render and faster to set up than volumes uh, and in my case it was a better solution uh, so you can see here this is a uh, very similar version of what we had for the Jupiter texture here. It is driving the color and we are driving the displacement down here. We are also driving the opacity. OK, because I want the clouds to sit on top. I want Jupiter to peek through in the uh, in the darker areas here. OK, so that's what that one is doing. So this is the uh, the clouds and the surface atmosphere mixed in with uh, the Jupiter flow map. Now, the last little section then was to try and uh, soften up this atmosphere because using the sphere had given me too sharp a line around the outside. Um, so I also decided I was going to start moving the, the sunlight around. So I was going to have a kind of a day to night transition. So I decided to add a volume atmosphere as well. Uh, now, this is a much more simple version of what I was doing in the other files. Take a sphere, turn it into a fog volume. Uh, this is just a, a wrangle just to increase the density here and previously we used to create uh, volume vops and create all our noise in Houdini 19 we have these nice volume noise nodes so this was going to break up my fog density here uh, so this is the bigger shapes here and then I'm going to create another smaller shape within that and more smaller shapes within that I go out over towards my uh, my volume shader here so instead of using this volume setup I have here, which is a little bit messy, what I would suggest instead is this. Go over to your material palette, just type cloud down the bottom here and drag your cloud volume into there. Get rid of the filter. And I would just point it over towards this and you can set your cloud color over here and your cloud density and you can play around with your scattering phase. And that is going to get you most of the way towards the final image this is the final result with the volume atmosphere put over the top which is going to create some scattering in the shadows here and is going to catch the light as the distance light that i've got moves around so you can see here as i flip between the two of these that i'm just introducing some some volumetric scattering across the planet's surface okay so that was the purpose of that uh, the last little part then was just adjusting the actual distance light up here 
Uh, and initially I started using a distance light. The problem with the distance light itself is it gives you quite a sharp shadow across the surface. I wanted to soften it up a little bit. So I used the sunlight instead. And the advantage to using a sunlight is that I can get access to the sun angle, which is going to soften off that hard edge just running across the planet's surface. So that was the last thing I needed to do. And then I just had to render the whole thing out. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a good idea of what you could do for next steps. So I hope you enjoyed the video and you got something out of it. I'd like to thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next video.